I'm Michael Fox, and this is the Prospector Podcast. And I have joining me regular contributor, Ted J. Butler. Welcome, Ted. Thanks for having me on, Mike. It's always a pleasure to do this. Yeah, I always like to follow up uh, with your stories because there's always a little bit more meat on the bones when we talk than uh, than actually appear in the stories. So I have had you on my cover now. This will be three issues in a, in a row talking about the electrification of the transportation grid in the world, um, more particularly in the Western world. And we kind of left the biggest elephant in the room, which was uh, cars and trucks to the very end. Uh, which was the cover of the the November issue. Right, yeah. I mean, we've done the planes, we've done the trains, now it's time for the automobiles. So I guess the place to start, Mike, is is really with the problem, which is that, you know, in the eyes of the government uh, and, and the corporations around the world, um, cars are polluting the environment. Um, so as, as with regard to how much that ex- exactly is, passenger cars, freight trucks and buses is the largest contributor to CO2 emissions in the transportation sector, accounting for about 75% of the global emissions in the, in the transportation sector globally. So uh, if we're just focusing on cars in particular, which we did, we're talking about 10 to 12% of global t- uh, CO2 emissions, um, which on a relative basis um, is about five times more than the emissions produced by the aviation industry, which we covered last week. Uh, last month, and about 30 times more than the direct CO2 emissions produced by rail. So, you know, cars are the problem um, as far as, um, you know, becoming more environmental is concerned. But um, the (laughs) estimates for how we get there and how quickly we get there require a bit more um, scrutiny, perhaps, which we'll do, do now, I assume. Yeah, there's uh, there's data, then there's the eye test and a lot of these things. Now, when you say it's 12%, is that 12% of the overall carbon emissions of the world or is that just 12% of the transportation emissions? So that's 12% of global global CO2 emissions in general. Okay, so it is a pretty significant amount of, of CO2 then. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so... We take a look at it. Um, I understand it's the uh, IEV association is suggesting that one out of four cars is going to be electric uh, this year and it's sold. And I kind of looked at that and you you kind of were we were talking about this off mic and our initial reaction being in the West was, yeah, no. Uh, but then when we think about it, China makes up the majority of all the electric vehicle sales in the world. I think the number is close to 50%. And so the, China being very good at manufacturing and, and selling electric vehicles to their own people, um, that one out of four could very well be, but that data is skewed very much to, to China and the East, is it not? It certainly is. I mean, so the IEA Executive Director Fatih Birol stated in April that one in four of the cars sold globally in the world this year will be an electric car. And as you say, uh, it's not impossible given the extent of China's um, dominance in this realm, but it is pretty ambitious considering that only 18% of car sales in 2023 were EVs, so less than one in five. So the IEA is basically saying we're going to go from less than one in five to one in four sales um, being EVs in in, spa- in the space of a year. And, you know, like I say, it's possible. But EV EV sales this year haven't been that great. Um, There is some sort of uh, short-term outperformance in China, like you mentioned. Um, uh, Tesla's China EV sales grew 19% year-on-year in September, so just last month. So there is the argument that we could get there. But um, really, Mike, I wanted to look forward more um, more towards 2035, um, which is what Birol talks about. He says every second car sold globally will be an electric car. And the IA basically presented two scenarios for how this might look. Uh, the first more conservative one is called the STEPS scenario. So this is where the IEA forecasts um, 51 million units of BEV sales, so battery electric vehicle sales, uh, 5.5 million units of uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle sales, and 200,000 units of FCEV sales, which is the fuel cell electric vehicle. So this basically means that given that uh, 2023 saw BV sales of 9.5 million and PHEV sales of 4.3 million. BV sales would need to increase 437% to 
in less than 12 years to meet this scenario. And PHEV sales would have to increase by a lot less, but still 27%. But then beyond that as well, the IEA actually has an even more optimistic scenario called the APS scenario, which is based on assumptions of a faster pace of EV adoption than STEPS. And as part of this, the IEA forecasts 62 million BV sales by 2035, along with 5.5 million uh, PHEV sales. And in this scenario, uh, BV sales would need to increase by 552% from 2023 to 2035. So we're, we're talking about huge increases here. Um, it's not impossible. And I'll get into why, you know, um, there's, a, there's a possibility that China can uh, push this IEA estimate through. But I just think it's very unlikely and it's very optimistic, to say the least. Yeah, like I'm listening to those numbers and I'm looking at actual vehicle sales and vehicle sales have been down the last uh, three or four years to the point where um, I've had some analysts suggest that we've reached peak auto about four years ago and that was the the most cars that were going to be sold and it's going to be uh, uh, downhill on a per year basis from from that point forward. So I, I, the eye test on those electric vehicles kind of don't match up with we're, with reality. The other thing that I wonder about is if we're not coming into a two-pronged world and bifurcation of this, China, um, you know, to their credit, are the kings of electric vehicles. They build them, they process them, they have an almost monopoly on them uh, because they control the metals that go into them. Um, they're able to do this, uh, much to the West's chagrin. And the West's response to this is to outlay, outright ban Chinese electric vehicles or to hit them with a, you know, with massive tariffs uh, to make them unaffordable in the West. Um, so given those head wins, you have to kind of wonder how much electric vehicle penetration is actually going to make it into to Western economies, would you not? Yeah, you make a great point, Mike. I mean, if you look at the EV battery manufacturers uh, in 2023 in general, um, CATL, which is the biggest in the world, China-based, you know, 34% share of total production. BYD, uh, 16%. You, you scroll down further down the list and there, there's some Korean, Japanese like LG, uh, Panasonic, but many of the top 10 are, are based in China, you know, CALB, uh, Pharisis Energy, you know, they're not huge, but they make up the numbers. And, and this monopoly is really where China's been able to, you know, that's where its dominance is grounded in, in the actual EV battery production. And we uh, wrote an article about that a few months ago. But I do think we are going to see this bifurcation like you talk about. Around one in 10 uh, vehicle sales in the US are EVs, but uh, in China, um, you know, you're talking about uh, producing some of, you know, 75% of all the world's EV batteries. And, and that component ac accounts for about 40% of the total cost of the EV itself. So there is this this kind of um, gap between emerging, as I think you talk about in your podcast that's coming out uh, soon or out, either out now or coming out soon, uh, between reality and expectations. Yeah, uh, that's uh, a chat I had with uh, Dr. Dave Lowey of Index. Uh, it'll be uh, it'll be out uh, probably just a couple of days ahead of this one here, so people can uh, you know go to our YouTube channel and, and listen to that. We're talking about. Uh, the compromises and the challenges of getting the critical metals for the green economy. And the the biggest challenge is the processing. It's it's all done in China um, for, you know, for reasons, you know, they don't have, you know, the same environmental protections. They don't have the same safety protections and they don't have the same, you know, employment issues we have in the West. Uh, and that makes it allows them to produce these batteries at a much lower cost and uh, uh, and without, you know, the you know the inconveniences of actually protecting the environment. So we, we were talking about the compromises that we need to make in the West. But one of the challenges that we uncovered in our discussion was that the production and processing of the of the materials to go into these batteries for us to reshore them or friendshore them 
is a decades long challenge. So if we're sitting here in 2024 and we want to have, you know, half the vehicles sold to be electric vehicles by 2035, and we can't process these things here for decades, the math doesn't add up. We can't get from A to B to C in 10 years because we don't have the, the ability and the facilities to, to actually do that. And unless, you know, there's detente, you know, with, you know, the economic uh, uh, fighting that's going on between China and the West, um, I don't see where that's going to change anytime soon. I, I absolutely agree, Mike. And one of the other things why it's not feasible as well is the actual availability of critical minerals to um, enact what the IEA is estimating. If we just take the best-selling car in 2023 alone, which was the Tesla Model Y, with about 1.23 million units sold, that, that's about one-third of total US EV sales. And of course, new models will arrive in the market in the meantime. But if we're talking hypothetically, uh, based on the IEA's estimates, the Model Y should have about 6.61 million units of sales by 2035. Um, and that's if we apply the same 437% uh, growth from the step scenario by the IEA. So that was their more conservative scenario. So in terms of how this relates to like a metal like lithium, which, you know, if, if we if we keep using the, the Model Y, which uses 30 kilograms of lithium um, in its lithium iron phosphate battery alone, we can say that the Model Y sold in 2035 would have consumed roughly 198,000 tons of lithium. And that equates to roughly one-fifth of the total global lithium production in 2023, which was estimated to be about 1 million metric tons. So if we take that further as well, I mean, I'm not saying the Model Y is going to represent all of the EV sales in 2035, but if we just make things easier for ourselves and do that, EV demand for lithium in 2035 would be two times the 2023 uh, global lithium production if the Model Y had a 100% EV market share. So that just gives you an idea, just for lithium alone, um, how difficult this would actually be from a, a metals consumption perspective. And I'll let you come in now, but I, I definitely want to talk about copper and, and silver and other metals too. Yeah, uh, that's, you know, that's lithium that doesn't take into account the cobalt, the magnesium and the nickel that goes into those batteries. And you're right, you know, the, the rest of the, the vehicle has an awful lot of copper and silver that goes into uh, into those vehicles. They're essentially they're, they're computers on wheels. Now, there's an awful lot of metals just in creating these vehicles. And again, a lot of that that processing is, is being done in China and not in the West. So um, all the roads to, to this success seem to lead through China. And uh, we don't have a plan really to, you know, to change that. And yet we're, you know, we're throwing stones. We certainly are. And um, I'm not really sure where the, where the U.S. goes from here um, in terms of uh, recalibrating that dynamic. I, I think... China have already established the direction of travel. They've already established the dominance and chasing the the tails in that sense is, is quite futile. I, I wonder whether it's better to perhaps focus on hybrid or hybrid vehicles or um, almost accept defeat in some sense because they've got such an advantage and it's going to be so difficult. And I think one thing that certainly won't work in terms of getting EV uh, sales to increase is the um, implementation of sanctions like we saw with Canada. Uh, on China, and and as we've seen in the, uh, the with the EU on China too, I think tariffs of around I think it's seventeen percent on or, or more than seventeen percent on companies like BYD, and that's going to increase the price of EVs and ultimately make them less attractive for the EU consumers or the Western consumers wherever they are, at least until these um, Western EV producers can uh, create enough vehicles to make them cheap enough for the the domestic uh, market to to purchase, but. I don't think that's going to happen because China is so dominant that their cost of production is going to be so low because of the economies of scale are so vast um, that they, they're just they're just too far ahead. Yeah, um, the West has an awful long ways to to go to catch up. Uh, um, I've often have said that you know I think that you know we're going to have to bridge a gap for quite a while. 
uh, using hybrids, but even that is is fraught with increased metal production because uh, a hybrid vehicle uses actually more lithium than a, a regular electric vehicle does. Um, the the hybrid batteries are are more lithium friendly, or more lithium in those batteries than there are in a regular uh, you know battery electric vehicle. Um, the other thing that you know you have to to take into account is that the uh, the catalytic converters on those vehicles actually use more platinum and palladium than a regularly gas aspirated right. engine does because they're constantly running on a cold stop because the the vehicles stop and start and run on the electricity uh, as well. So yeah, we we shift some of our our challenges away from what China's got monopolies in, but we still need more and more of the metals to to still have these vehicles. So uh, it's kind of ex exchanging one problem for another. Absolutely. And, and in that sense, you mentioned platinum and palladium. I think that's an interesting one to watch. I mean, Rick Rule always says, um, you know, he, he pays attention to what's hated. And right now, PGMs are pretty hated. I'm not saying that they're um, the most compelling investment commodity out there right now. But if you look at the supply situation in South Africa, which is incredibly compromised and has been uh, since the load shedding, I'm not sure quite how severe that is. I need to look into that again. But I, I am aware that there is uh, serious barriers to entry in, in terms of, um, you know, making PGM mines um, feasible and, and plentiful in terms of their production. Um, and I do believe that if this hybrid scenario arises where um, EVs are um, put to one side and the, and the realization that to get away from internal combustion engines, we're going to have to straddle across with hybrids actually, you know, happens, then PGMs could see a bit of a resurgence. And I'm not saying that's definitely the case, but I think it, it warrants further exploration. Yeah. The thing that I've always, you know, argued with, uh, with the hybrid versus the electric vehicle is the, the human equation. One of the objections that people have in North America is that, you know, you if you have an electric vehicle, it's got a range of approximately, and we're in Canada and, and the UK, so we're going to use kilometers, sorry, you know, to our American listeners, but you generally have a range of about 300 kilometers to a tank of, uh, to a charge of uh, battery on one of these vehicles. Whereas if you have a, a hybrid vehicle, um, you know, the charge of battery is equivalent to a few, uh, filling up your fuel tank. So filling up your fuel tank uh, generally gets you a range of about 650 to 725 kilometers per tank. And to charge the car, if it's a rapid charge, you're still 30 to 40 minutes to charge that battery versus less than five minutes to fill, fill up your tank with gasoline. So... It's, I liken it to the fast food dilemma, you know, do we eat fast food because it's good for us? No, we eat fast food because it's quick it's, and it's convenient and it's not good for us. You know, we use gas cars because it's quick and it's convenient, not necessarily because it's good for the environment. But I look at it as that hybrids are less bad for the environment than what gasoline cars are, even though they use gasoline, but they use a far less amount of it. Therefore, we're making some steps and you're not taking someone from, you know, eating a steady diet at McDonald's to, you know, going on a diet, which is, you know, never particularly works and then people are fighting it all the time. So you've kind of got this stepping block to take them from that, fully gas car all the way to an electric car over a time frame while we catch up to China is is the way it kind of works in my brain. But um, I'm not a climate scientist. I'm not a government official. I'm not an engineer. But my eye test tells me this. You know, your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, that's a really good point. But one thing I did want to add about it, I'm wary of time, Mike, as well, um, is with regards to the fact that innovation, uh, thrifting, substitution, all these things could completely change the direction of travel that, that we're even talking about now. I mean, just as an example, Samsung's solid state battery came is, is being really put on this pedestal as a potentially one that could make EVs more um, 
efficient, um, pack more energy into each unit of volume. You know, they're talking about being able to travel 600 miles, uh, which is double the range of today's most popular models. Uh, they're saying this could come in 2027 or 2028. Um, I believe there is high cost of production and it may be limited to the premium EV models, but it just gives you an idea that, you know, this could change very quickly depending on what substitution um, wins out. Uh, and this is why it's kind of futile extrapolating out for metal consumption. But I, I do agree with you that we, we are heading towards a situation where hybrids will need to take some of the load away from the EVs because they're just not ready to be um rolled out yeah and the nice thing about hybrids is, is they're still scalable like you can get hybrids that could get you an even larger uh uh range than the you know the range that i have mentioned but they're more costly so you know there is some scalability there and and the, you know that is a possibility but it's it's still it's not the perfect solution and everybody kind of wants perfect and sometimes better has to, you know, has to take uh, take hold before we get to perfect. Absolutely, and I think perf perfection is never uh, obtainable anyway, um, just philosophically speaking. But yeah, I think it's just about compromise, really. And um, hybrid is that. Yeah. Well, that's uh, given uh, this week's uh, podcast topics. Compromise seems to be the word of the week, but. Uh, you know, there's there's lots that has to change in order for us to reach those goals. Uh, you know, we have to stop fighting with China over over stuff. Uh, we need to start to reshore some of this production back into our markets so that, you know, we're not reliant on a single source supplier uh, as we are currently to some degree. Uh, we have to train lots more people to work in the mines that's going to produce the ore, that's going to fill these batteries, you know. Uh, I, I I really don't want to be a, a politician or a planner. These these challenges seem daunting. They certainly do. And I think a lot of the CEOs in the legacy car manufacturing space, like Jim Farley, they're kind of out of touch with the with the reality of it as well. They're trying to push the narrative. You know, Jim Farley said recently, I love electric vehicles. It has nothing to do with politics. And he says, for me and for millions of Americans, electric vehicles are removing daily hassles and reminding us why we love to drive. And that's all well and good, Jim, but 47% of US adults said it would not be likely for them to buy an EV. So there's again, there's this disconnect between expectations and reality of how even even if the EVs are rolled out, whether actually a demand would exist amongst certain demographics. Yeah. And, you know, there's other potential headwinds. You know, if, you know, there's a US election, if Donald Trump were to win, there's a chance that EV subsidies could go away. He is, he is toyed with that idea, although that was before he kind of made friends with Elon Musk again. So maybe that, that thought has gone away. But, uh, you know, there's there's potential headwinds that could occur in, in that fashion. Um, then, you know, uh, Vice President Harris, who's running on the other ticket, is suggested to uh, create uh, critical metals reserves very similar to the oil and the uranium reserves that the U.S. has and use that to give cost assurances uh, to the critical metals that need to go into the electrification but that's essentially removing the subsidies from the consumer end and putting into the manufacturing so that they can produce the vehicles for a lower cost. Um, is that going to be enough to bring the price down where consumers would be more apt to purchase it when they're not receiving, you know, a, a substantial subsidy per vehicle that they're that they're buying? These are questions that we we really don't have answers to. Mm, I think the biggest obstruction to EV sales will be the potential price increase that arises from, you know, this uh, geopolitical fragmentation that we, we speak about uh, that seems to be increasing and becoming increasingly hostile. But also, like you say, the, the governmental side, whether the, the all the progress in inverted commas uh, from the Inflation Reduction Act is completely invalidated by the, the next uh, presidential uh, candidate, you know, whether Trump completely wipes it out and you know, there's no subsidies for EVs, or would he do that to his friend Musk? Who knows? Um, will Kamala actually back the EV revolution as she says she will? Perhaps, but a lot of, a lot of this uncertainty could 
uh, drive people away from from EVs, quite literally. Pardon the pun. <laughs> yeah, well, it certainly can. And we haven't even talked about infrastructure that's going to be needed to support that, which I believe will be your uh, your next article available in the November issue, if I'm not mistaken. I think that sounds correct, Mike. Yeah, I'm very much looking forward to getting stuck into that. And I'm sure we'll have another good conversation on the back of it. Uh, most definitely. Now, the, if people want to follow your writing, your musing and your work, uh, apart from uh, the Prospector News, where else will they find you? The best place, probably my LinkedIn. That's where I post most regularly, uh, at Ted J. Butler. Um, so you can find me there. Also on Twitter, or X as we call it now, Ted J. Butler. And feel free to shoot me a DM if you've got any questions. Perfect. Uh, I'll make sure that uh, people get those links and uh, we'll link the uh, the uh, headline story of the uh, the September October issue talking about the uh, the electric vehicle market. And uh, I look forward to your uh, your next uh, set of musings on the infrastructure support of needed uh, for the November issue. And I believe your and my paths are going to be crossing in uh, December. We're both going to be at the uh, uh, resourcing tomorrow event. It's being held in London in the UK uh, the first week in uh, December. Is that not correct as well? That's true. And I'm very much looking forward to that. I think I'm going to be talking about silver on a panel, uh, talking about where we've come and where we're headed and whether we are at the point where it's silver's golden moment. Um, that's the question I asked in the In Gold We Trust report, which you can read online. Um, and yeah, I think it's a real, very interesting time for Silver, but that's a whole uh, different podcast together, Mike, as you know. Uh, yeah, that definitely is. Uh, you're a little further along. I haven't been quite given my marching orders as to uh, which panels I'm on and, and supporting. So I, I hope to find that out in the next couple of weeks so I can be prepared by the time London rolls around and it's coming up pretty fast. So uh, if you find yourself in the UK in that first week in December, I Highly recommend the event. It's uh, it's very worthwhile. They get experts from all over the world and all world governments to talk about these challenges that uh, uh, we talk about on these podcasts. So until then, Ted, it's been a pleasure. Likewise, Mike. Thanks for having me. The Prospector News Podcast is for educational purposes only. The opinions expressed are those of the participants and are not to be taken as investment advice. Listeners need to do their own due diligence and seek advice of a licensed investment advisor.